for the charges of bigamy. I sentence you. News special report. Here's David Gregory. Good afternoon from Washington. We're going to go to the White House in just a moment to hear from President Obama, who's got a lot on his plate right now. A busy start to August, a time to get away, but not here in Washington, with Congress still wrangling over immigration. New jobs numbers out today that were steady improvement for the economy, and of course, crises overseas as well. At the White House is our Chuck Todd. Chuck, what are we going to hear from the president? Well, David, we expect the president to at first talk about the economy, those economic numbers that have come out, the fact that there have been six straight months of, of job growth, over 200,000, something that we haven't seen in over 15 years. We also expect him to take a few shots at Congress. Uh, this hasn't been a pretty week on Capitol Hill, particularly among House Republicans and their ability to try to get the president some resources that he asked for specifically to deal with the humanitarian crisis at the border. So there will be some politics that's being played here. The timing of this press conference, no accident, Frank. Frankly, David, when it comes as Congress is supposed to leave town, the president, he won't be leaving town for another week. So we expect a lot on that. But as you say, there is a ton on his plate. We do expect questions. He'll take a few questions. You've got Gaza. You've got the situation with Ukraine, Ebola. you got the John Brennan situation at the CIA. So this is, uh, this is one of those press conferences where there is a lot on the minds of the reporters in this room uh, on topics all over the globe. And the president, as Chuck mentioned, uh, likely to take questions here, which will uh, which will cover this entire waterfront. And no doubt, Chuck, in an election year as well, the president is mindful of inability to get something done on immigration, but there were votes there to potentially sue the president. There is, and in fact, that that's what the, the White House is almost fired up about that lawsuit. You'll hear a lot today about it. Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Friday. Uh, I thought I'd take some questions, uh, but first, let me say a few words about the economy. Now, this morning we learned that our economy created over 200,000 new jobs in July. Uh, that's on top of about 300,000 new jobs in June. Uh, so we are now in a six-month streak with at least 200,000 new jobs each month. Uh, that's the first time that has happened since 1997. Over the past year, we've added more jobs than any year since 2006. And all told, our businesses have created 9.9 .9 million new jobs over the past 53 months. That's the longest streak of private sector job creation in our history. And as we saw on Wednesday, the economy grew at a strong pace in the spring. Companies are investing, consumers are spending, American manufacturing, energy, technology, autos, all are booming. And thanks to the decisions that we've made and the grit and resilience of the American people, we've recovered faster and come farther from the recession than almost any other advanced country on Earth. So the good news is the economy uh, clearly is getting stronger. Uh, things are getting better. Our engines are revving a little bit louder. And the decisions that we make right now can sustain and keep that growth and momentum going. Um, unfortunately, uh, there are a series of steps that we could be taking to maintain momentum and perhaps even accelerate it. There are steps that we could be taking that would result in more job growth, higher wages, higher incomes, more relief for middle, uh, middle class families, and so far at least uh, in Congress, we have not seen them willing or able to take those steps. Uh, I've been pushing for common sense ideas like rebuilding our infrastructure in ways that are sustained over many years and support millions of good jobs and help businesses compete. Uh, I've been advocating on behalf of raising the minimum wage, making it easier for working folks to pay off their student loans, fair pay, paid leave. All these policies have two things in common. All of them would help working families feel more stable and secure. And all of them, so far, have been blocked or ignored by Republicans in Congress. That's why my administration keeps taking whatever actions we can take on our own to help working families. Now, it's good that Congress was able to pass legislation to strengthen the VA. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the chairman and ranking members who were involved in that. Uh, it's good that uh, Congress was able to at least fund transportation projects for a few more months before leaving town, uh, although it falls far short of the kind of infrastructure effort that we need uh, that would actually accelerate the economy. Uh, but 
for the most part, uh, the big ticket items, the things that would really make a difference in the lives of middle class families, those things just are not getting done. Um, let's just take a recent example, uh, immigration. We all agree that there's a problem that needs to be solved in a portion of our southern border. And we even agree on most of the solutions. But instead of working together, instead of focusing on the 80 percent where there is agreement between Democrats and Republicans, between the administration and Congress, House Republicans, as we speak, are trying to pass the most uh, extreme and unworkable versions of a bill that they already know is going nowhere, that can't pass the Senate, and that if it were to pass the Senate, I would veto. They know it. They're not even trying to actually solve the problem. This is a message bill that they couldn't quite pull off yesterday, so they made it a little more extreme, so maybe they can pass it today. Just so they can check a box before they're leaving town for a month. And this is on an issue that they all insisted had to be a top priority. Now, our efforts administratively so far have helped to slow the tide of child migrants trying to come to our country. But without additional resources and help from Congress, we're just not going to have the resources we need to fully solve the problem. That means while they're out on vacation, I'm going to have to make some tough uh, choices to meet the challenge, with or without Congress. And yesterday, even though they've been sitting on a bipartisan immigration bill for over a year, House Republicans suggested that, since they don't expect uh, to actually pass a bill that I can sign, that I actually should go ahead and act on my own to solve the problem. Keep in mind that just a few days earlier, they voted to sue me for acting on my own. And then when they couldn't pass a bill yesterday, they put out a statement suggesting I should act on my own because they couldn't pass a bill. So immigration has not gotten done. Uh, a student loan bill that would help folks who have student loan debt consolidate and refinance at lower rates, that didn't pass. The transportation bill that they did pass just gets us through the spring when we should actually be planning years in advance. States and businesses are raising the minimum wage for their workers because this Congress is failing to do so. Even basic things like approving career diplomats for critical ambassadorial posts aren't getting done. Last night, for purely political reasons, the Senate Republicans, for a certain period of time, blocked our new ambassador to Russia. It raised such an uproar that finally they went ahead and let our Russian ambassador pass at a time when we are dealing every day with the crisis in Ukraine. They're still blocking our ambassador to Sierra Leone, where there's currently an Ebola outbreak. They're blocking our ambassador to Guatemala, even as they demand that we do more to stop the flow of unaccompanied children from Guatemala. Now, there are a lot of things that we could be arguing about on policy. That's what we should be doing as a democracy. But we shouldn't be having an argument about placing career diplomats with bipartisan support in countries around the world where we have to have a presence. So the bottom line is this. We have come a long way over the last five and a half years. Our challenges are nowhere near as daunting as they were when I first came into office. But the American people demand and deserve a strong and focused effort uh, on the part of all of us to keep moving the country forward and to focus on their concerns. And the fact is we could be much further along and we could be doing even better and the economy could be even stronger and more jobs could be created if Congress would do the job that the people sent them here to do. And I will not stop uh, trying to work with both parties to get things moving faster for middle class families and those trying to get into the middle class. When Congress returns next month, uh, my hope is that instead of simply trying to pass partisan message bills on party lines uh, that don't actually solve problems, um, they're going to be willing to come together to at least focus on some key areas where there's broad agreement. Um, after all that we've had to overcome, our Congress should stop 
standing in the way of our country's success. So with that, let me take a couple of questions, and I will start with Roberta Rampton of Reuters. Thanks. I want to ask about the situation in the Middle East. And why do you think Israel should embrace a ceasefire in Gaza when one of its soldiers appears to have been abducted and when Hamas continues to use its network of tunnels to, to launch attacks? And also, have you seen Israel act at all on your call to do more to protect, protect um, civilians? Well, uh, first of all, I think it's important to note that um, we have and I have unequivocally condemned uh, Hamas and the Palestinian factions that were responsible for killing two Israeli soldiers and uh, uh, abducting a third almost minutes after a ceasefire had been announced. Uh, and the UN has condemned them as well. Uh, and you know, I want to make sure that uh, they are listening. Uh, if they are serious about trying to resolve this situation, that soldier needs to be unconditionally released as soon as possible. Um, uh, I have been very clear throughout this crisis that Israel has a right to defend itself. No country can tolerate missiles raining down on its cities and people having to rush to bomb shelters uh, every 20 minutes or half hour. No country can or would tolerate tunnels being dug under their land uh, that can be used to launch terrorist attacks. Uh, and so, uh, you know, not only have we been supportive of Israel uh, in its right to defend itself, but in very concrete terms, for example, in support for the Iron Dome program that uh, has intercepted uh, rockets that are firing down on Israeli cities. Uh, we've been, uh, you know, trying to cooperate as much as we can to make sure that uh, Israel is able uh, to protect its citizens. Now, at the same time, we've also been clear that innocent civilians in Gaza uh, caught in the crossfire uh, have to weigh on our conscience and we have to do more uh, to protect them. Uh, a ceasefire was one way in which we could stop the killing to step back and to try to resolve some of the underlying issues uh, that uh, have been building up over quite some time. Uh, Israel committed to that 72-hour ceasefire, uh, and it was violated. Uh, and trying to put that back together uh, is going to be challenging, but we will continue to make those efforts. And, and uh, let me take this opportunity, by the way, to give Secretary John Kerry credit. He has been persistent. He has worked very hard. He has endured, on many occasions, really unfair criticism, uh, simply to try to get to the point where the killing stops and uh, the underlying issues about Israel's security, uh, but also uh, uh, the, the concerns of Palestinians in Gaza, uh, can be addressed. Um, we're going to keep working towards that. Uh, it's going to take some time. Uh, I think it's going to be very hard to put a ceasefire back together uh, again uh, if Israelis and the international community can't feel confident that Hamas can follow through on a ceasefire commitment. Um, and and it, it's not particularly relevant whether uh, a particular leader in Hamas ordered this abduction. The point is, is that when they sign on to a ceasefire, uh, they're claiming to speak for all the Palestinian factions. And if they don't have control of them, and, and just uh, moments after a ceasefire is signed, you have Israeli soldiers being killed and captured, uh, then uh, uh, it, it's hard for the Israelis to feel confident that uh, a ceasefire can actually be, uh, be honored. Um, I'm in constant consultation with Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, uh, our national security team is in constant communication with uh, the Israeli military. Uh, I want to see uh, everything possible done uh, to make sure that Palestinian civilians uh, are not being killed. Uh, and it, it is heartbreaking to see what's happening there. Um,
and, and I think many of us recognize uh, the dilemma we have. Uh, on the one hand, Israel has a right to defend itself, and it's got to be able to get at uh, those rockets and those tunnel networks. On the other hand, uh, because of the incredibly irresponsible actions on the part of Hamas to, to oftentimes house uh, these rocket launches right in the middle of civilian neighborhoods, uh, uh, we end up seeing uh, people who had nothing to do with these rockets uh, ending up being hurt. Um, part of the reason why we've been pushing so hard for a ceasefire is precisely because uh, it's hard to reconcile uh, uh, Israel's legitimate uh, need to de uh, defend itself with uh, our concern with those civilians. And, and if we can pause the fighting, then it's possible that we may be able to arrive at a formula uh, that, uh, that, that spares lives and, and also uh, ensures uh, Israel's security. Uh, but it's difficult, uh, and I don't think we should pretend otherwise. Okay? Bill Plan. Mr. President, like that ceasefire, you've called for diplomatic solutions not only in Israel and Gaza, but also in Ukraine, in Iraq, uh, to very little effect so far. Has the United States of America lost its influence in the world? Have you lost yours? Yeah. Uh, look, this is, this is a common theme uh, that uh, folks bring up. Um, apparently, uh, people have forgotten that America, as the most powerful country on earth, still does not control everything around the world. Um, and so, uh, you know, our diplomatic efforts often take time. Uh, they often uh, will uh, see progress and then a step backwards. Uh, that's been true in the Middle East. That's been true uh, in Europe. That's been true in Asia. That's, that's the nature of, of world affairs. Uh, it's not neat and it's not smooth. Um, but if you look at, for example, Ukraine, we have made uh, progress in delivering on what we said we would do. Uh, we can't control how Mr. Putin thinks. But what we can do is say to Mr. Putin, if you continue on the path of arming separatists with heavy armaments that uh, the evidence suggests may have resulted in 300 innocent people on a jet uh, dying, uh, and that violates international law and undermines the integrity, uh, territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine, then you're going to face consequences that will hurt your country. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of skepticism about our ability to uh, coordinate with Europeans for a strong series of sanctions. And each time we have done what we said we would do, uh, including this week when we put in place uh, sanctions that have an impact on key sectors of the Russian economy, uh, their energy, their defense, their financial systems. Um, it hasn't resolved the problem yet. I spoke to Mr. Putin this morning and I indicated to him just as we will do what we say we do in terms of sanctions, we'll also do what we say we do in terms of wanting to resolve this issue diplomatically if he takes a, a, a different position, if, if he respects and honors uh, the, the right of Ukrainians to determine their own destiny, uh, then it's possible to make sure that uh, Russian interests uh, are addressed, that are legitimate, uh, and that Ukrainians are able to make their own decisions, uh, and we can resolve this conflict and, and uh, end uh, some of the bloodshed. Uh, but the point is, though, Bill, that uh, if you look at the 20th century and the early part of this century, um, there are a lot of conflicts that America doesn't resolve. That's always been true. Uh, that doesn't mean we stop trying. Uh, and it's not a measure of American influence on any given day or at any given moment uh, that uh, there are conflicts around the world uh, that are difficult. Um, you know, conflict in Northern Ireland raged for a very, very long time until finally something broke where the parties decided that it, it wasn't worth uh, killing each other. Uh, the Palestinian-Israeli conflicts have been going on uh, even longer than you've been reporting. 
Um, you know, and, 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 and uh, I, I don't think at any point was there a suggestion somehow that uh, uh, America didn't have influence just because uh, we weren't able to finalize a Israeli-Palestinian peace deal. Um, you know, you will recall that uh, situations like Kosovo uh, and Bosnia uh, raged on for quite some time, and there was a lot more death and bloodshed uh, than there has been so far uh, in, in the Ukrainian situation before it ultimately did get resolved. Uh, and so uh, I, I recognize with, with so many uh, different issues popping up around the world, uh, sometimes it may seem as if uh, this is an aberration or it's unusual. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, is that um, there's a big world out there uh, and that as, as indispensable as we are to try to lead it, uh, th there's still going to be tragedies out there and there are going to be conflicts and uh, our job is to just make sure that we continue to project uh, what's right, uh, what's just, uh, and you know that we're building coalitions of like-minded countries and, and partners uh, in order to advance not only our core security interests but also the interests uh, of uh, uh, the world as a whole. You think you could have done more? Uh, on which one? On any of them. Well, well, look, uh, you know, I think Bill, the the, uh, um, the nature of being president is that you're always asking yourself, what more can you do? Um, but with respect to, let's say, the Israeli-Palestinian uh, issue, uh, this administration invested an enormous amount to try to uh, bring the parties together around uh, a framework for peace uh, and a two-state solution. Uh, John Kerry invested an enormous amount of time. Um, in the end, it's up to the two parties to make a decision. We can lead them to resolve some of the technical issues and to show them a path, but they've got to want it. Um, with respect to Ukraine, uh, I think that uh, we have done everything that we can to support uh, the Ukrainian government uh, and to deter Russia from uh, uh, moving further uh, into Ukraine. Uh, but short of going to war, uh, there are going to be some constraints uh, in terms of what we can do if uh, President Putin and Russia uh, are ignoring what should be their long-term uh, interests. Uh, right now, if w what we've done is, is impose sufficient costs on Russia that, objectively speaking, they should President Putin should want to resolve this diplomatically, get these sanctions lifted, get their economy growing again, and have good relations with Ukraine. Uh, but uh, sometimes people don't always act rationally, and they don't always act uh, uh, based on uh, their medium or long-term interests. Um, that can't deter us, though. We've just got to stay at it. Wendell. President, Republicans point to some of your executive orders as a uh, reason they say that they can't trust you to implement legislation as they pass. Even if you don't buy that argument, do you hold yourself totally blameless in the inability, it, it appears, to, to reach agreement with the Republican-led House? Well, Wendell, uh, you know, let, let's just take the recent example of immigration. Um, a bipartisan bill passed out of the Senate, uh, co-sponsored by uh, not just Democrats, but some very conservative Republicans who recognized that the system currently is broken. And if, in fact, we put more resources on the border, provide a path in which those uh, undocumented workers who've been living here for a long time and may have ties here are coming out of the shadows, paying their taxes, paying a fine, learning English. If we fix the legal immigration system so it's uh, more efficient, uh, if we uh, are you know, attracting young people who may have studied here uh, to stay here and uh, create jobs here, uh, that that all is going to be good for the economy. It's going to reduce the deficit. Um, it, 
might have forestalled some of the problems that we're seeing now in the Rio Grande Valley uh, and with these unaccompanied children. Uh, and so we have a bipartisan uh, bill, Wendell, bipartisan agreement supported by everybody from labor to the evangelical community to law enforcement. So the argument isn't between me and the House Republicans. It's between the House Republicans and the Senate Republicans, and House Republicans and the business community, and House Republicans and the evangelical community. Um, I'm just one of the people they seem to disagree with on this issue. So that's on the comprehensive bill. So now we have a short-term crisis with respect to uh, the Rio Grande Valley. They say we need more resources. We need tougher border security uh, in this area where these unaccompanied children are showing up. We agree. So we put forward a supplemental to give us the additional resources and funding to do exactly what they say we should be doing. And they can't pass the bill. They can't even pass their own version of the bill. So that's not a disagreement between me and the House Republicans. That's a disagreement between the House Republicans and the House Republicans. Um, it, it, the, the, the point is that uh, on a, a range of these issues, whether it's tax reform, whether it's reducing the deficit, uh, whether it's rebuilding our infrastructure, um, we have consistently put forward proposals that in previous years and previous administrations would not have been considered radical or left-wing. They would have been considered pretty sensible, mainstream uh, approaches to solving problems. I'd include under that, by the way, the Affordable Care Act, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, and in, in circumstances where even basic common sense, uh, plain vanilla legislation can't pass because House Republicans consider it somehow um, a compromise of their principles or giving Obama a victory, then we've got to take action. Uh, otherwise, we're not going to be making progress on the things that the American people care about. Um, and action on the on the uh, the border supplement. Well, I'm going to act alone. I, I'm going to have to act alone uh, because we don't have enough resources. Uh, we've already been very clear. We run out of money, uh, and we are going to have to reallocate resources in order to just make sure that uh, some of the basic uh, functions uh, that have to take place down there whether it's making sure that these children are properly housed or making sure that we've got enough immigration judges to process their cases, uh, that those things get done. We're going to have to reallocate some resources. Uh, but, but the broader point, uh, Wendell, is that uh, if, in fact, House Republicans are concerned about me acting independently of Congress, despite the fact that I've taken fewer executive actions than uh, my Republican predecessor, or my Democratic predecessor before that, or the Republican predecessor before that, um, then the easiest way to solve it is pass some legislation. Get things done. On the supplemental, it, uh, we agreed on 80 percent of the issues. There were 20% of the issues that perhaps there were disagreements between Democrats and Republicans. As I said to uh, one Republican colleague who was down here uh, that I was briefing about some uh, national security issues, uh, why wouldn't we just go ahead and pass the 80% that we agree on and we'll try to work uh, to resolve the differences on the other 20%? Why wouldn't we do that? And he didn't really have a good answer for it. Uh, so uh, th 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 there's no doubt that I can always do better on everything. Uh, including, uh, you know, making additional calls to uh, Speaker Boehner and 
you know, have, having uh, more conversations with uh, uh, some of uh, the House Republican leadership. Uh, but in the end, the, the challenge I have right now is that uh, they are not uh, able to act even on what they say their priorities are. Uh, and they're not able to work and compromise even with Senate Republicans on certain issues. And they, are, they consider what have been traditionally uh, Republican-supported initiatives, uh, they consider those as somehow uh, a betrayal of the cause. Yeah, you know, take the example of the Export-Import Bank. This is, this is an interesting thing that's happened. I mean, th th this is a program in which uh, we help to provide financing to sell American goods and products around the world. Every country does this. It's traditionally been championed by Republicans. For some reason right now, uh, the House Republicans have decided that we shouldn't do this. Which means that when American companies go overseas and they're trying to close a sale on selling Boeing planes, for example, or uh, a GE turbine or some other American product that has all kinds of subcontractors behind it and is creating all kinds of jobs, uh, and all sorts of small businesses depend on that sale, and that American company is going up against a German company or a Chinese company, and the Chinese and the, American, uh, the German company are providing financing, and the American company isn't, we may lose that sale. Why? When did that become uh, something that Republicans opposed? It'd be like me having a car dealership uh, for Ford, and the Toyota dealership offers somebody financing, and, and I don't. We will lose business, and we'll lose jobs if we don't pass it. So, you know, there, there's, some, there's some big issues where I understand why we uh, have differences. Right? On taxes, uh, you know, Republicans want to maintain some corporate loopholes I think need to be closed because I think that we should be, be giving tax breaks to families uh, that are struggling with child care or uh, trying to save for a college education. Uh, on health care, obviously, their view is, is that uh, we should not be helping uh, folks uh, get health care, uh, even though it's through the private marketplace. Uh, my view is, is that in a country as wealthy as ours, we can afford to make sure that everybody has access to affordable care. Um, those, are, those are legitimate policy arguments. But getting our ambassadors confirmed, these are career diplomats, not uh, political types. Um, making sure that we pass legislation to strengthen our borders and put more folks uh, down there, uh, those shouldn't be controversial. And I, 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 and I think you'd be hard-pressed to find uh, an example of where I wouldn't welcome uh, some reasonable efforts to, uh, to actually uh, get a bill passed out of Congress that I could sign. Uh, last question, uh, Michelle uh, Kaczynski. Thank you. Um, you made the point that in certain difficult conflicts in the past, both sides had to reach a point where they were tired of the bloodshed. Do you think that we are actually far from that point right now? And is it realistic to try to broker a ceasefire right now when there's still tunnel operations allowed to continue? Is that going to cause a, a change of approach from this point forward? Well, keep in mind that the ceasefire uh, that had been agreed to would have given Israel the capability to continue to dismantle these tunnel networks, uh, but uh, uh, the Israelis can dismantle these tunnel networks without uh, uh, going into major population centers in Gaza. Uh, so uh, I think the Israelis are entirely right that, that these tunnel networks need to be dismantled. Uh, there is a way of doing that while still uh, reducing the bloodshed. 
Uh, you are right that in past conflicts, sometimes um, people have to feel deeply the costs. Uh, anybody who's been watching some of these images, uh, uh, I, I, I'd like to think, uh, should recognize the costs. Um, you know, you have children who are getting killed. Uh, you have women, defenseless, who are getting killed. Uh, you have uh, Israelis whose lives are disrupted constantly uh, and, and, and living in fear. Uh, and, and those are costs that are avoidable if uh, we're able to get a ceasefire that preserves uh, Israel's ability to defend itself uh, and uh, gives it the c capacity to have an assurance that they're not going to be constantly threatened by uh, rocket fire in the future, and conversely, uh, you know, uh, an agreement that you know, uh, an agreement that uh, uh, the Palestinians uh, need to be able to make a living, and the average Palestinian's uh, capacity to uh, uh, to live a decent life. Um, but it's hard. It's going to be hard to get there. Uh, I think that. Uh, uh, th th there's a lot of anger and there's a lot of uh, despair uh, and you know, that's a volatile mix. Um, but we have to keep trying. Uh, and uh, it, it is, you know, Bill asked earlier about American leadership. Uh, part of the reason why America remains indispensable, part of the essential ingredient in American leadership is that we're willing to plunge in and try, where other countries don't bother trying. You know, I mean, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that in all these crises that have been mentioned, there may be some tangential risks to the United States. Uh, in some cases, as in Iraq and ISIS, those are uh, dangers that have to be addressed right now, and we have to take them very seriously. Um, but for the most part, these are not, you know, the rockets aren't being fired into the United States. Um, the reason we are concerned uh, is because we recognize we've got some special responsibilities. Uh, we have to be, have some humility about what we can and can't accomplish. Uh, we have to recognize that our resources are finite and, you know, we've, we're coming out of a decade of war. Uh, and, and you know, our military has been stretched very hard, uh, as has our budget. Nevertheless, we try. We go in there uh, and we make an effort. And when I see John Kerry going out there and trying to broker a ceasefire, uh, we should all be supporting him. There shouldn't be a bunch of complaints and second guessing about, well, it hasn't happened yet, or nitpicking. Uh, before he's had a chance to uh, complete his efforts. Uh, because I tell you what, there isn't any other country that's going in there and making those efforts. Um, and more often than not, as a consequence of our involvement, uh, we get better outcomes. Not perfect outcomes, not immediate outcomes, but we get better outcomes. Um, and uh, uh, that's going to be true with respect to Middle East. That's going to be true with respect to Ukraine. Um, that's going to be certainly true with respect to Iraq. Um, and uh, I think it, it's useful for me to end by just reminding folks that, um, you know, in my first term, uh, if I had a press conference like this, typically, everybody would want to ask about the economy and how come jobs weren't being created and uh, how come uh, the housing market's still bad and, you know, why isn't it working? And, well, you know what? Uh, well, we did work, and the economy's better. And you know, w when I say that we've just had six months of more than 200,000 jobs that hasn't happened uh, in 17 years, uh, you know, that shows you the power of persistence. It, it shows you that if you if you stay at it. 
uh, eventually we make some progress. All right? I thought that you guys were going to ask me uh, uh, how I was going to spend my birthday. What happened to the happy birthday thing? I will, I will uh, address two points. Uh, I'll address... Uh, hold, hold, hold on, guys. Come on. I, the, uh, the, the, there's just uh, I, I, you're not that pent up. I've been giving you I've been giving you questions lately uh, on Brennan uh, and uh, the CIA. Uh, the RDI report has been transmitted. Uh, the uh, the declassified uh, version uh, that will be released uh, at the pleasure of the uh, the Senate committee. Um, I have full confidence in John Brennan. Uh, I think he has acknowledged and directly apologized to uh, Senator Feinstein that uh, CIA personnel did not properly handle an investigation as to how certain documents that uh, uh, were not authorized to be released to the Senate staff uh, got somehow into the hands of the Senate staff. Uh, and uh, it's clear from the IG report that some very poor judgment was shown in terms of how that was handled. Keep in mind, though, that John Brennan was the person who called for the IG report. Uh, and uh, he's already st stood up uh, a task force to make sure that uh, uh, lessons are learned and mistakes are resolved. Um, with respect to the larger point of the RDI uh, report itself, um, even before I came into office, uh, I was very clear that uh, in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, uh, we did some things that were wrong. We did a whole lot of things that were right, but we tortured some folks. We did some things that were contrary to our values. I understand why it happened. Uh, I, I think uh, it's important uh, when we look back to recall how afraid people were uh, after uh, the ti Twin Towers uh, fell and, and the Pentagon had been hit and the plane in Pennsylvania had fallen and people did not know uh, whether more attacks were imminent. Uh, and there was enormous pressure uh, on our law enforcement and our national security teams to try to deal with this. Uh, and, um, yeah, you know, it, it, it's important for us not to uh, feel too sanctimonious in retrospect about the tough job that those folks had. And a lot of those folks uh, uh, were working hard and under enormous pressure and are real patriots but having said all that we did some things that were wrong and that's what that report reflects and that's the reason why after uh, I took office one of the first things I did was to ban uh, some of the in extraordinary interrogation techniques that are the subject of that report um, and my hope is, is that this report uh, reminds us once again that you know, the character of our country has to be measured in part uh, not by what we do when things are easy, but what we do when things are hard. Um, and, uh, and, and, and when we engaged in some of these enhanced interrogation techniques, techniques that I believe and I think any fair-minded person would believe were torture, uh, we crossed the line. Uh, and, and that needs to be, uh, that mean, need, needs to be understood uh, and accepted. Uh, and we have to, as a country, take responsibility for that so that hopefully we don't do it uh, again in the future. Now, now I, 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 I gave you a question. Uh, the, uh, we've, got, uh, we've got a U.S.-Africa summit coming up next week. Uh, it is going to be an unprecedented uh, gathering of uh, African leaders. The importance of this uh, for America needs to be understood. Uh, Africa is one of the fastest growing continents in the world. You've got six of the ten fastest growing economies in Africa. You have 
all sorts of other countries like China and Brazil and India deeply interested in uh, working uh, with Africa not to extract uh, uh, natural resources uh, alone, which traditionally has been the relationship between Africa and the rest of the world, but now because Africa is growing and you've got thriving markets and you've got entrepreneurs and uh, extraordinary talent uh, among, uh, among the people there, and Africa also happens to be one of the continents where America is most popular and, and, and people feel a real affinity for our way of life. And we've made enormous progress over the last several years in, in uh, not just providing traditional aid to Africa, helping uh, countries that are suffering from uh, malnutrition or helping countries that are suffering from AIDS, but rather partnering and, and thinking about how can we trade more and how can we do business together. And that's the kind of relationship that Africa is looking for. Uh, and, and I've had conversations over the last several months with U.S. businesses, some of the biggest U.S. businesses in the world, and they say, Africa, that's one of our top priorities. Uh, we want to do business with those folks. Uh, and, and we think that we cr can create U.S. jobs and send U.S. exports uh, to Africa, but we've got to be engaged. And so this gives us a chance to do that. It also gives us a chance to talk to Africa about security issues. Um, because um, as we've seen, you know, terrorist networks try to find places uh, where uh, governance is weak and security structures are weak, and uh, if we want to keep, our saves over the safe, uh, keep ourselves safe over the long term, then one of the things that we can do is make sure that we uh, are partnering with some countries uh, that uh, really have pretty effective security forces and have been deploying themselves uh, in peacekeeping and, and uh, conflict resolution uh, efforts uh, in Africa. Um, and, and that ultimately can save us and our troops and our military a lot of money if we've got strong partners uh, who are able to deal with uh, conflicts uh, in these regions. So uh, it's, it's going to be a, a, a terrific conference. Uh, I, I won't lie to you, traffic will be bad here in Washington. Uh, I know that uh, everybody's been warned about that, um, but, uh, uh, but, but we are really looking forward to this and I think it's going to be a great success. Now, uh, last thing I'm going to say about this, uh, because I know that it's, uh, it's been on people's minds, uh, is uh, uh, the issue of uh, Ebola. Uh, uh, this is something that we take very seriously. Uh, as soon as there's an outbreak anywhere in the world of any disease uh, that uh, could have significant effects, um, the CDC uh, is in communication with, with the World Health Organization uh, and other multilateral uh, agencies to try to make sure that we've got an appropriate response. This has been a more aggressive Ebola outbreak than we've seen in the past, um, but keep in mind that it is still uh, affecting parts of three countries, uh, and we've got uh, uh, some 50 countries represented uh, at this summit. We are doing two things with respect to the summit itself, we're taking the appropriate precautions. Folks who are coming from these countries that have even a marginal risk or an infinitesimal risk of uh, having been exposed in some fashion, we're making sure we're doing screening uh, on that end of, uh, as they uh, leave the country. We'll do additional screening when we're here. We feel confident that the procedures that we've put in place uh, are appropriate. More broadly, uh, the CDC and our uh, various health agencies are, are going to be working uh, very intently with uh, the World Health Organization uh, and uh, some of our partner countries to make sure that we can surge some resources down there and organization uh, to these countries that are pretty poor and don't have a strong public health uh, infrastructure so that we can uh, start containing uh, the problem. Keep in mind that uh, Ebola is not something that is easily transmitted. Um, that's why generally uh, outbreaks uh, uh, dissipate. Uh, but the key is identifying, quarantining, isolating uh, uh, those who contract it and making sure that practices are in place uh, that avoid transmission. 
Um, and it can be done, but it's got to be done in an organized, systematic way, and uh, that means that we're going to have to help these countries uh, accomplish that. All right? Okay. There you go, April. That's what I was talking about. Somebody finally wished me happy birthday. Although it is, it is until Monday. You're right. You're right. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, guys. President Obama in the briefing room, an expansive president this afternoon, the first day of August, with a lot, as I said at the outset, on his plate. The president also sour at times, blasting Congress for inaction on immigration and other matters, and st st standing, I should say, very strongly with Israel. Even as a ceasefire has broken down between Israel and Hamas uh, over the abduction, apparently, of an Israeli soldier, just after that ceasefire had been announced, the president condemning Hamas, also saying it would be hard. He would get an agreement on a ceasefire if Hamas cannot control its own people. Our chief foreign correspondent, Richard Engel, is in Gaza with an update on this situation, both the search for the missing soldier, Richard, and have you seen an expansion of the offensive on the part of Israel? Uh, David, the president sounded very pessimistic, and here I can tell you there's a lot of pessimism. There was a ceasefire in place here, and it was holding, but it only held for 90 minutes. That's when Hamas militants launched an attack, killing two Israeli soldiers, capturing a third. This happened in the southern part of the Gaza Strip. The Israeli government doesn't know if this soldier is alive, dead, or injured. There is now a massive operation underway in that location in southern Gaza to try and find this soldier or even just find his remains. Tanks have moved in. Uh, soldiers in the tanks are using bullhorns telling people to stay indoors. We went from a ceasefire to an escalation today, David. All right. Uh, Richard Engel in Gaza tonight. The president also standing behind John Kerry, his secretary of state, saying more often than not, when the United States tries to reach a peaceful solution, uh, it can be helpful in getting a better solution, even if it's not a perfect solution. Those efforts will continue. More tonight on NBC Nightly News with Brian Williams. I'm David Gregory in Washington. Have a good afternoon.